Olá a todos, eu sou o Denis Jardim, oncologista clínico do Hospital Sírio-Libanês de São Paulo. É um prazer continuarmos aqui na cobertura das novidades no Congresso Americano de Tumores Geniturinários aqui em 2020 pela Onconius. Então é com grande prazer que eu vou começar agora a entrevista com o Dr. Lawrence Klotz. So, it's a great honor for us, Dr. Klotz, to be here with you. Dr. Klotz, a neurologist, professor from the University of Toronto, and we will hear from him about some news, some very intriguing data that we saw during this meeting. And I would like to start with an amazing data that was presented. It's uh, your data about new biomarkers in the urine, especially this small non-coding RNAs, as a technique to detect and evaluate prostate cancer. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So this is actually uh, the first time this data was presented uh, at a public meeting, although it's quite mature and the work's been going on for a few years. So the, it's a urine assay, no DRE is required, and it is based on urinary exosome microRNAs, a panel of them. So, the, so exosomes are these very tiny vesicles that are shed by cancer cells. A typical cancer cell may shed thousands of them a day and they contain important biologic ma material and in particular they contain microRNA. Uh, microRNA is non-coding RNA, so it's RNA that's involved in regulatory process. So for example, gene silencing is a very important function of these microRNAs and there are, there are thousands of them. So for this study, the initial discovery work was to screen a panel of almost 7,000 different microRNA sequences in the urine of about 235 men with or without prostate cancer, very well characterized. And from that, 280, the 280 most prognostic sequences or microRNAs were selected out. And those were the basis for three different assays. One was for the presence of or absence of cancer, one was for grade group one versus two to five, and one was grade group one and two versus three to five. And really, uh, the extraordinary thing is the predictive value of this panel of uh, non-coding RNA biomarkers is extremely strong. It's because each one of them independently has predictive value. You put the whole group of 280 together and it's very powerful. So we presented the validation results in approximately 1,440 patients. So a large group of patients which included both a training subset and a validation subset. Uh, the whole range of no prostate cancer grade group 1 to 5 and the, the uh, accuracy was really uh, very high so the area under the curve of the ROC curve for these three assays varied from somewhere around 0.96 to 0.98. Almost too good to be true because we know the biopsy which was the gold standard, this was a biopsy cohort, is not perfect for predicting radical prostatectomy pathology. Uh, so uh, this is preliminary work. There's more work to be done and the next step which is ongoing is to validate it against a radical prostatectomy cohort. But at least this initial validation data looks really promising and if this pans out this will I think potentially be a game changer because it means you could follow the patients with for example the grade group 1 versus 2 to 5 assay, follow patients on surveillance if there's a change in the signal means you, you, know, you can rely on that. And so we're quite excited about that, but you know, definitely more work to be done. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, one question, how reproducible is this test? I mean, do you think it can be used in all parts of the world? It's an easy access test yeah, for the so, future. So there's a company behind this, which is called Mir Scientific. Uh, they are ramping up in a big way. So uh, they, are, uh, they foresee this as being something that will be available throughout the world. The cost would be relatively modest in the hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. Uh, so, you know, I think, uh, I mean, we have to get to first base, but I think re really it has the potential certainly to be uh, very widely available for patients all over the world. Yeah. Do you see that 
for the future. There's a potential to be a diagnostic test for men with risk of prostate cancer instead of screening or more for the patients that are already have a diagnosis and want to be on well, surveillance? I, I think potentially both. I mean, the idea is, I, I think the basic concept that we're moving to with screening is PSA. I don't think PSA is going to go away. It's too, too useful. Uh, and then in the men with an elevated PSA, probably a second test. Now, this could definitely be that second test, and pr presumably you would start with the the basic cancer, no cancer test, and then move on to the other assays. Of course, there's many other assays in this area now, select MDX, um, um, exosome, uh, the serum assays like PHI and 4K, so, uh, plus the tissue-based assays. There's a whole slew of assays. They're all trying to do the same thing. And uh, I mean, a, a challenge for us going forward is to work out which one is best. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah. But the area under the curve for this assay, it, again, recognizing its early days, is superior. There's no question. Yeah, that was wonderful. Congratulations on this Thank great you. job. And you also honor us with a wonderful lecture about active surveillance, how to integrate. Can you summarize what are the main points? Sure. So to make a long story short, the lecture was called Novel Tools in the Active Surveillance Pathway. So first of all, I reviewed the MRI data and the, there's an important take home message and now this has been re reinforced, I, I think, by multiple groups. MRI is a game changer. It's made surveillance much better because it's picked up the occult aggressive cancers early, but it's not perfect and it's seriously not perfect. So it misses about 15 to 20 percent of significant cancers, target biopsies that is, depending on the patient's underlying risk. And uh, so systematic biopsies cannot be dispensed with. You still need to do them. And the idea is to use what's called a Bayesian approach or a risk stratifying approach. If you have a patient who, for example, is just mildly at risk for higher grade cancer, and he has a negative MRI, that risk may drop to a point where you don't need the biopsy. But in the kind of average patient who's got maybe a 20 or 30 percent chance of significant cancer, they still need the systematic as well as the targeted biopsies. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about, one of the new innovations is called micro ultrasound or high resolution ultrasound. So this is a 29 megahertz device, looks like a regular ultrasound device for transrectal imaging but the resolution is 70 microns versus about 200 microns for conventional ultrasound. So 70 microns is the diameter of a prostatic duct. It means you can see changes in ductal anatomy, just like with MRI, you can see the cancers. And so uh, th there's uh, data now that this is as sensitive, if not more sensitive than an MRI for finding significant cancers. And it's appealing because it's inexpensive, it's urology driven, urologists are doing it, and it's one-stop shopping. So instead of having to have MRI, see the target, register the target, do the fusion, you see the lesion on ultrasound and boom, you biopsy it. So that, that I think is, is going to be an alternative to MRI, I don't see it replacing MRI. And then you have... Uh, this biomarker world that I referred to that's very robust, new biomarkers coming along all the time, the, the um, microRNA one and uh, a number of others. Uh, and so then the question is, how are we going to use these in the surveillance population? So the first message, in my opinion, is the average patient who has very low risk or a small amount of low-grade cancer probably doesn't need the molecular biomarker because their risk of metastasis is so low, it's not going to help. So the sweet spot for the tissue-based biomarkers is the patient who's got Gleason 3 plus 4, you know, grade group 2. Surveillance is an option for some of those patients, and the confirmation from the tissue-based biomarkers that they are at low risk for adverse pathology is very reassuring. Uh, so, you know, there, it's clear that some of these 3 plus 4 patients can be managed safely with surveillance and we have to make some strides to really just sort out how to pick them better. Uh, 
So that was really the gist of my talk. Yeah, that was great. And we are almost done with ASCO GU. We are doing the last day here. So to finish, I would like to hear from you. What are the other take home points that you think it's important from this conference? Well, I've really enjoyed this meeting. To me, the strength of this meeting is it's really multidisciplinary. So, you know, compared to the AUA, EAU and so on, which is probably 90% urology, this is a real mix of different specialties. So you get a chance to catch up with people from radiation and medical oncology uh, and, you know, plan collaborations and so on. Uh, in terms of the breaking news at this meeting, to me, uh, prostate cancer, it's a period of consolidation, all this data, the amazing data on the ARATs, all these positive trials, sequencing how to use them, uh, quite a bit about that, but nothing really drastically new. But I think in bladder and kidney, the, the, there, there are so many positive trials now coming out using combinations of immuno-oncology drugs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors together, uh, giving better results. And I, I think, uh, t to me, uh, we, we are making huge progress in both of those sites. I mean, bladder arguably hasn't really advanced in 35 years. Now we're making some advances. So that, to me, was quite exciting. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Klotz, for bringing so much information to honor us with your expertise. Pleasure. And we hope to see you in Brazil in a few weeks, probably, right? I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all. We are finalizing this transmission. It was a pleasure to be with you.